Hey, welcome to Talknosis. Today we have Oliver Solomon. He's a writer, he's a musician, he's a mindfulness uh, facilitator, and he is a teacher of the Gurdjieff tradition. He's just started a new YouTube channel. I don't know when you're listening to this. You, you could be listening to this 10 years from now and it won't be new, but if you're listening to it in 2024, folks, it's relatively newish. Uh, YouTube.com slash at a turn inward. This will also be in the show notes. Check out everything that Oliver is doing. Ollie, that is the basically the only bio that we do. We're not one of those shows where we introduce ourselves or make it easy for people who have just discovered the show or make the top of the show interesting. We just dive right in. But there is a bit of a biographical question here, which is on your channel, you mentioned that you've been practicing mindfulness for, for almost 20 years now. What initially drew you to this path? How has your practice evolved over time? First of all, thanks for having me. Thank God we're just right in the deep end. I'm, I'm not <laughs> one for dilly dally. Yeah, honestly, I think I was just really lucky in there's this nature versus nurture argument. And mm. I, just, I think I just was gifted with a really generous amount of anxiety as a kid and a lot of fear that made me very introverted and made me cast a lot of my attention inside of me. Of course, that wasn't all fun. But it made me a listener. It made me really quiet. It made me extremely shy and maybe less than athletic. I'm sure we all miss out on certain things to invest in other things. But I got really into my internal environment and maybe my inquiry into my internal environment. The unexamined life is not worth living. I was quite a kid, but like really enjoyed movies really enjoyed comic books really enjoyed novels really enjoyed like weirdly wholesome but weird stuff like the muppets or wind in the willows or things that kind of smacked of something a little more there's something a little more mythic to it especially myths and stories like that really into king arthur that moves to star wars i got baby on this cup here so there you go it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. but a lot of those mythic kind of things that seem to have a generative quality to it a bit more of a heart and that that stumbled me into lapsing in catholicism lapsing out of catholicism i guess i should say because i just i was given a bit of a blessing from it my mother's french canadian catholic and that's a heavy load um and so I went through a lot of the stuff because my grandma was around at the time and you want to keep up those appearances and it's her tradition and all that. But to be honest, my mom did this amazing kindness to me where I'd gone through a lot of the, uh, the sacraments and at confirmation, she asked me, do you want to do this? And I said, no, I don't. I don't. So I just feel, I feel guilty about a lot of stuff. And even though that's a feature and not a bug, she, she said, okay, well, you don't have to do this. And then all of a sudden that, that weight weirdly lifted. And I remember running into a bunch of books, the Tao of Pooh by Benjamin Hoff. My father had this fantastic book called Zen Classics by R.H. Blythe, which is a fantastic book. And I started to see connections in a lot of the stories I was reading. And so I went to school and started Hinduism and mysticism and then fell into meditating here in Montreal, Leonard Cohen's old spot. And then I fell into what's called the Gurdjieff work. And that's a very quick pre but here I am. Yeah, very cool. I should mention as well, I, I've known Oliver for about 17 years now. So it's really exciting to, to have him on the show. So we've had uh, many amazing private conversations uh, about a lot of this stuff. So it's really great to bring it public. But in your videos, you discuss the quote unquote terror of the situation. Isn't spirituality and meditation all about light and love? Or, or saying it's not. Is the terror of the situation the same thing as finding Jesus or embracing religion because of divorce or death or tragedy? That's such a fantastic question. I'm glad that you sent me a cheat sheet before because I was walking around thinking about this. <laughs> it really it is. And in my experience, and I'm just really trying to speak from my 20 years of experience, which is really... Yeah not that long compared to a lot of people, just my experience. Speaking from that experience, I it is that it isn't. It's an aim that I think that most people are seeking for to get to that space of love and sweetness and light. But we also look at the world and we see 
craven, covetous people in power who are the opposite of that. So one of the ways that I've really enjoyed modeling this is that there is normal and there's natural, right? These are not always the same thing. There could, they can overlap. Hmm. I do think it's natural to be, to come from love and light and joy. If you, you've ever even spent five minutes around a young child, young baby, you can see this. That's the source we come from. I truly do. Yeah. Or 24 seven. Which is my present. All uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Shout out to Serafina. That's, that is our natural. That doesn't mean it's what's always happening. And it's really an incredible paradox. And a lot of these consciousness questions are ex extremely paradoxical. So that's going to be my answer. Most of this interview, that's a bit of both, but it's also our normal is anxiety and credit card debts and impending nuclear war and incredibly crass people in power who are saying things that we know are not true in our experience. So this is this weird kind of balancing that can take a lot of energy out of our lives and really leads that I, it would tire people out so much so that I would understand why they wouldn't feel like they have any capacity for mindfulness or higher pursuits when really we're already coming from that. So it's, that's that paradoxical thing. Like we're already there, but yet we might have to do a little work to realize we're there. It's that sort of circular kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I will go back to that point of joy being our, our heritage, our, our birthright and, uh, not to be too cheesy, uh, but, but being a, fa a father, that's, uh, okay, so I'm doing a uh, master's uh, in philosophy uh, in psychoanalysis, and, and basically in a bunch of really depressing stuff, right? Yeah. That really, uh, that sometimes talks about really depressing aspects of, of human existence. Right. And, and being a father, having the child around constantly, it, it has made me realize that, that people are basically good. People are basically joyous. People are basically happy, not always when they go to bed or get the food that they don't like, or they, they want to watch 10 more minutes of Miss Rachel. The baseline is joy. You often speak about the concept of psychological sleep and, and the importance of waking up. How would you explain this idea to someone who is completely new to mindfulness, meditation, Zen, Gurji, what have you? Yeah, that's another thing I've been thinking about for a long time, especially trying to unpack this and do an introductory course about it, because along my own path, I've had some beginner's luck and then, then there's been some dips and valleys, but there's one thing that I've really noticed is the more missionary zeal I come out with to explain this to people, that's a guarantee that I'm going to bore people. And I've learned this years ago and sometimes I fall back into it, hopefully not in the course of this interview but i can really make yeah. people's eyes glaze over when i sort of proselytize about this i can pull my wife in right now she'll tell you all about it <laughs> not you but <laughs> it from me yeah 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 so what i really want to do and what one of my goals is to make this non-mystic that just to put that away to just so we're going to disconnect that we're going to put that on the workbench for a little bit I just go, what's our lived experience? What's what's your day-to-day -day like? How do you feel about the time that you're spending in your day and your attention? And uh, how, do, how do you feel right now, really just bringing it back to an embodiment practice? I really think that if I was to strike, if I had to redact to maybe 10, 20 words, a lot of this stuff, it really is an embodiment practice that I've learned. Is That's the worth, the worth of a lot of this is whatever you want to call it, being in the moment, wakefulness, waking up, self-remembering. We all have our sort of, our preferred sort of versions of that. It's just being here now in our body and being in our body right now, I would ask people, how do you, what do you think about that? What do you think about being in your body? How often do you feel you're in your body? It could certainly be more than I am. That's, there's a whole, there's a whole strata of hum humanity some people are way more in their body I, I really feel 
a lot of my friends growing up who were better athletes were more in their body than I was. I think that I was more in my emotions and my mind and more introverted. It's a bit of a simplistic model, but it's a beginning kind of way to look at things. I, I was hit by comic books and awesome books and awesome movies. And I was a little more intimidated to move into my body. So that was a bit of a stronger a bit obstacle for me where some people I knew were instantly in their body. They wouldn't think about asking that girl out. They would do it where I might write a poem about her and before I know it, my friend was dating her. Yeah, no, I can't really relate. I, I was a Chad playing sports. So you the wedging up the nerds. I, I can't really relate to what you're talking about, but I'll try to understand. I'll try to, to be empathetic. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jason, I, I'm I'm going to let you speak in a moment. The next question is very important, but but I just have to get a yeah. quick ramble in, which is, is there sometimes two extremes in modern Gnosticism, what people want Gnosticism to be, which is the the old stereotype that it's all about the body, hating the body, getting out of the body. Then you have some sort of new age embrace of Gnosticism, right? Which is it's it's all that piece of love. You just have to uncover it. The demiurge is just a metaphor. Where I, I try to strike a balance where, you know, the pro, there's issues with being itself. Uh, I, I would argue that Gnosticism talks more about kind of our intellectual preconceptions uh, of religion, of who we are, of what we are, how those are prisons, than it does the body. The body is connected to the passions. It is connected to some stuff that you at least have to deal with. I, I think there is some truth to what Gnosticism has to say about the body. This is all to say, yes, connecting with the body, I think, is more important than ever uh, because we can choose not to live an embodied existence. So I, I can live the ideal of some Internet Gnostics right now. I can quit my job. I can go on welfare. I, I can smoke pot all day so I don't have to feel my body. Yeah. I can hop on the internet so yeah. that I'm not using my body, right? I, I can create a, a terrible pleroma of my own, <laughs> if this is what I thought Gnosticism was. But that said, it, it, this is a life for many people, maybe not that much of an extreme, right? We live a, a disembodied existence. It seems like day in, day out, we have more of a disembodied existence. But turning to the mind, Oliver, Descartes said, I, I think, therefore I am. In what ways do you disagree with this? Man, that's a high fastball. That one. <laughs> You've had the sheet ahead of time. I did have the sheet, and I, w I was definitely thinking about it because I remember reading years ago, someone, and I had seen that quote, obviously, if you've ever gone into high school in the West, you've seen that quote, obviously, super formative. I saw someone say, I read some sort of article in the past, distant past, it was saying that Descartes was arguing, I think, therefore, I exist in a way that because I have thoughts, there's some sort of proof that I am here as an individual being. Even though that might be an imperfect individual like consciousness. So I remember seeing that. I know that's not what you're asking, but I was really fascinated by that. So... The original kind of thing, I, I think I've seen people write books called Descartes Error, and I'm not, and so we could just take the super superficial Rene Descartes, what I take it from, and, and I'm not going to try to attribute to it, but it does lead us down interesting things. Um, we think that we think, and that's who we are, therefore I am. And there's, there's, when I went to school, before I actually started putting my butt on the cushion, I studied a lot of Hinduism and Buddhism, and one of the traditions I was absolutely fascinated by it. I had a really strong emotional connection to is Advaita Vedanta of non-duality in Hinduism. And that led on, I think, to Zen, although not intellectually necessarily. So very quickly, Advaita Vedanta, non-duality, it's not subject and object. So I'm not here as the object and you guys are the subject or vice versa. This is just consciousness so mind begets matter rather than the other way and that's not necessarily germane but it's you got to get rid of that for a second so the i think therefore i am there's a great non-duality teacher speaker paul hederman on youtube that i've really enjoyed in the last couple of years he doesn't know it but i'm a big fan of him but he uses the term selfing mm. the process thinking 
of ourselves as a separate self is the process that we do that keeps us separate and tells a story of me versus this person, me versus my boss, me versus that rude cashier at the store. And that it, it reinforces the separateness of things that has been dissolved by a lot of traditions at Baker the Dots of being the primary one, but also Zen, a lot of Zen Buddhism as well. And I think a lot of just by virtue of the pursuit of mysticism is the dissolving of the separateness, right? So to take that from a very basic misunderstanding of Descartes, I think therefore I am is part of the problem, really, in my life and has been part of the error, not Descartes' error, but Oliver Sullivan's error of me seeing myself as separate and seeing myself as, and I don't know who said this quote, This I have a, I, I'm full of Zen quotes. <laughs> this is why I don't know who said this, but Zen is life rather than feeling something about life. Mm. And mm. I, Let, let's say all of a sudden. So, yeah. yeah, so I'm saying that right now. You can quote me on that. But yeah, Zen Buddhism and a, a whole lot of different traditions, definitely, is feeling something about life, feeling life as it happens, rather than feeling our interpretation of it given our personality, given our programming, given so like meaning life at the quick and, and the rubbing to it. That's, I think that's mysticism to me. Okay. I've got to jump in here. <laughs> I've been sitting on my hands. Yeah. And also John didn't actually say that I was here. So in case you're listening on the podcast the whole time, All you've right. been wondering who that other guy was. <laughs> this is Jason here. I'm one of the co-hosts. Hi, Jason. Uh, hi, John. <laughs> I forgot. Sometimes I forget people listen to it as a podcast and actually listen to it as a podcast a lot more than watch the YouTube. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I'm not as right. Are ready? Hi. Yeah. Jason's here. Yeah. So many thoughts. But to jump maybe to the most recent one is the purely from a, oh, that reminds me of something kind of vibe is that uh, a lot of classical stoicism. So not the, I don't feel my emotion stoicism, but the like philosophical approach is, is often talking about that we're not like when a thing happens. That if it's upsetting you, the thing that's upsetting you is your judgment about the thing, Absolutely. not the thing. To suggest that something shouldn't have happened or that it's not fair or yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Not even to say that those things aren't in some way true or valid or useful as a method of planning a next action, but they're not true in a universal sense. The all, all, they, all they are is judgments. And so that really connected to me with me there about what you were saying of like the selfing, the creating separations and then defining yourself based on those separations. That that really speaks to me a lot. The other thing, so we, I think skipped over it a bit, but I want to go back to the, that that phrase, the terror of the situation. And I know in one of your uh, video episodes, you actually, I think you outlined where you got the term from. Yeah. But, and I, I think if you want to mention that so people can track it down, that's great. But I also want to just touch on why the word terror, like why that, yeah. it's a stark word and I'm not critiquing it, but I want to discuss yeah. it. Absolutely. I, I think that's really fair. And I appreciate you picking up that thread. So you have to see the bars before you understand you're in a prison, right? That's very caustic. It's yep. great. We are what I had. I'm trying to keep it back to my experience. Mm -hmm. One of the things I realized in my teenage years, as I started to get deprogrammed and reprogrammed with Eastern I'm not even trying to quantify it that way, but as I was starting to see these really amazing then different ideas is realizing how often, and I didn't even see it as in my body at that time, just how often I was automatic and I was not as awake as I could have been. And I'm using, for those listening to the podcast, I'm using air quotes, but awake, remembering, present, mindful, whatever you want to use. And the re the way that came out, I, I suspect, is because I had moments when I was so extremely awake and conscious, and just I could taste colors. Man, this was this was not chemically induced. There are these weird moments that stood out in my life where, yeah, I think you could call them peak experience, flow state. That's a very psychological kind of model, and I'm not going to quibble on that, but. We need to find a language that works with each other. So I think most people or a lot of people can look back in their life and see a, those moments when things are just so real mm. and strong. And some of them come from extremely, they can come from, unfortunately, trauma, 
they can come from extremely positive experiences as well. Some of them are extremely banal. Like I remember one time just standing under my, the tree in the, on the front lawn of where I grew up back in Toronto. And it was a maple tree with the maple keys and they were just falling. And I was pulling on, when you fall on the, you call on the branch and you make the helicopters fly down. I was doing that. I just had this moment of, I was seeing in Technicolor, man. Like it was just, it was very young. Sometimes that's a help because what that looks at is, so what's happening the 99.9% .9 of the time that's not happening. What's going on when I'm not conscious? It doesn't mean everything has to be beautiful and light, but when I'm not really feeling in my body and I'm really feeling grounded, excuse me, what's going on? And that's the terror of the situation. The terror of the situation is that you're not there. And you're asleep. And, and, the, and it's the terror of realizing yes. I've been asleep. That's it. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. That's, that is a very important turning. It's mm -hmm. a very important revelation because obviously that's remembering. And it's, you know, in the matrix, that's a terrible scene when all of a sudden he shows up and he's being pulled out. Or when didn't they live, when he finally puts those glasses on that first time, that first revelation, that's that moment where you go, oh no, we are not in Kansas anymore. Or we're following well, the rabbit down the, we're following the white rabbit down the, the rabbit hole. So that incredible revelation, what it's twinned with is the weight of, then why am I not? And what's going on the rest of the time? And what's going on with the rest of the people in my life? What's going on with the people running this world? Are they conscious? What What's going on with everyone else then? Who's seeing into this and how do I, can I communicate this? Is it going to come back? And that becomes a whole, in, in the Zen tradition, there's the 10 ox herding pictures that talks about the taste of presence or mindfulness or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing. That's why I have a little bit of, personally, I prefer not to use the term waking up because waking up denotes it happens once and you're good. Yeah. This is not a, this is not a diploma that I have on my wall. I graduated from mindfulness in university. <laughs> it's not it. It doesn't work like that for me. Maybe other people, man, fair dues to you, but this is, it's a muscle that once you realize that you can use it, you go, damn, why haven't I been using it or what has stopped me from using it? And that becomes that's where there's more questions than answers, but I often, sorry, I cut you off there. Oh, that's the terror. Yeah. yeah. I've often tried to find a way, cause we also sometimes do these episodes of what we call pop gnosis, where we take like the movie Barbie or, or yeah. you know, another movie or something. Yeah, and we, we talk about it. I haven't seen Barbie yet, but I've heard there's a real. Oh yeah. yeah. Watch it and we'll have you back. <laughs> cause <laughs> yeah, that'd be you hear your take on it would be great. But so at the beginning of those shows, any, and any other time I, I do a show where I think somebody might be listening who doesn't have a, just a basic understanding of Gnosticism, then they might be here because they saw Barbie or what have you, is I try to describe it as either having a sensation or having a feeling that there is a, a wider experience than you normally get access to, and then trying to answer the question of why don't I get to live there all the time? Yeah. So that that's exactly what you're talking about there too. And that, yeah, that terror, like it's... Yeah. It would seem, it would make the world seem like a prison if you're like, why don't I get to be out there all the time? Although, now here's, I know I'm really going going off the, the list here, John, but here's a question of everyone was fully conscious all the time. Is that clarity, can one operate in that kind of clarity? Can you make a sandwich in that kind of clarity or, or yeah, is it blinding? You're, nail, you're nailing it because like, how do you know that you're in paradise if you're always in paradise? Right. Mm. It's, and I know that's not exactly what you asked. Can everyone, can you rephrase that for me? It was a little bit. If so, if everyone were to awaken, to use that term, if to realize that you've been asleep, or if everyone were to realize the terror of the situation and abandon autopilot, the autopilot of our bodies and social pressures and stuff like that, if we were all fully conscious all the time. Is that, are we all just dumbfounded or can we, can you make a sandwich? You know what I mean? Like when you're, while yeah. you're also awake. Yeah, this is, that's really fast. And I think, I, I hope so. Like I really, <laughs> so. I, there's a really good, I think John and I talked about this. There's a great Jungian analyst, Robert A. Johnson. Those Robert A. Johnson books that we talked about. So he has one, he was, he's taught by Jung. 
and he had a really good one called Transformation. And I'm not sure if it was this was straight from Young, his model. There's the second dimensional man, the third dimensional man, and the fourth dimensional man. And he used literary allusions to mm. describe them. So basically, our, our first state is second dimensional. We're in paradise. Whether you're a kid, whether you're in your 16-year-old, he uses Don Quixote for that. Like, Don Quixote is the chivalric. He's in that world of medieval fantasies. Honor is very clear cut. You got maidens and you got giants and you go again, mm. save the maiden. That's paradise, right? So we got to come out of that paradise into third dimensional man, which is Hamlet is divided against himself. He doesn't know, Ophelia, leave me alone. I got important things to do. Like he's divided against himself. Mm. And from what I think I've learned, and I hope this changes, most of us stay in third dimensional man. We stay in that end woman, third dimensional man or woman, and we stay within that. And we don't always come back to the, we come out to the fourth dimensional man and woman, which is Faust by Goethe, where he hears mm. the bells on, of Easter in the church and comes back to realize the beauty of life. That's the one book I haven't read out of this. So I read Don Quixote and all that. But all that to say, the metaphor that he tells in that book is that the second dimensional man comes home and asks his wife, this was written in the 60s, so, you know, heteronormative kind of stuff, great assault, asks his wife, what's for dinner? The second dimensional man asks that, right? Then the third dimensional man comes back home and says, What's for dinner? But I can't think of dinner right now. There's too much suffering in the world. Who am I to eat dinner while there's people starving and all that? And then the fourth dimensional man comes back from work and says, what's for dinner? He comes back around that circle. Mm. So this is what I hope. I hope we can make that sandwich, but we can make that with incredible presence and love. And hopefully we're making that sandwich and sharing it as well. Okay. Power with people rather than the the third dimensional man's power over people. So mm. I do hope for that. I greatly hope for that. Yeah, I hope that answered. You made me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Yeah, it's dinner time here. But yeah, no, I thank you. I yeah, there was just something that occurred to me when I was hearing you talk about it earlier, like on your podcast or on your channel, and then and even here, I just so I wanted to dig into that a little. John, do you want to bring us back on track at all? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, all the, you mentioned the, seeing the bars of the cage, right, and invoking Gnosticism. Is Gnosticism in any way an influence on your path? However, you may define that that slippery term. Greatly, you know me, John. I'm a big dickhead. And Man loves dick. It's fan of felt gay dick, and that that is. We know how versatile Gnosticism is, right? But we know how incredibly flexible it is. The, they live and I Truman show is one and that other one, the matrix, but I've also seen it applied to blood meridian, you know, yep. all sorts of different things, but at its heart, it's the beating heart of that, the generative, the charge that I plug into the wall is that we are not, we see through a glass darkly, right? We, there's more to this life that we are capable of seeing and we can get to, and it's not our fault. We don't see it. That's, there's something going on in many traditions and I certainly, I would love to hear from both of you guys about that because how do you equate forces and how do you equate fate and what's operative? Like we don't want to be, everyone's against me, but at the same time, there's interesting things that stop us from opening our eyes too quickly. There is a, a Gurdjieffian sort of scholar who trained with young Maurice Nicole, fantastic, fascinating guy. He said, not every acorn becomes an oak. Why is that? Why is that? That we, we certainly want everyone lift our, to lift themselves to the greatest possibility they can. But what, what else is going on? What is that psychological sleep? A, a lot of people have anthropomorphized it, given it's maybe a twirly mustache kind of vibe. <laughs> uh, that works for some people. That works for them. It's not really doesn't work for me. I see it as a force of entropy in a way. Um, but again, Maurice Nicole, he's very interesting in that way where he talks about the Gurdjieff work, one of the things I trained in, as a struggle against life, which sounded very pessimistic. Why would you want to struggle against life? But he talks about life as in your 
habits. You're struggling against your habits. You're struggling against your programming. You're struggling against um, the entropy that's in your life of just, nope, you are this person and you're in this, this is your cultural kind of river and you go down here and you're going to do this and all that. But there's a healthy amount of resistance that, that needs to happen for someone to grow, whether that's going to a gym whether it's doing a 5k run, whether it's playing jazz piano or wanting to meditate, there's a healthy amount of resistance that's needed. And that's, that's part of the really interesting thing that you really start to realize as you come into some sort of work tradition, for lack of a better word, some sort of mindfulness tradition. One of the things you were saying there about what is it that's getting in the way, what kind of forces, I think it often a very like either surface level or early engagement with Gnosticism has somebody I think reading a summary probably or watching a summary of Gnosticism and going, great, now I can blame somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now it's someone else's fault. Yeah. Um, spiritual bypassing. Yeah. And and then and then it ends there. Like yeah. it's Gnosticism without Gnosis. It's Gnosticism yeah. Yeah. as as a list of things to blame versus like versus asking what the resistance can what resistance can be offered. Like I often think about the usefulness, never mind. Are, is the are the demiurge and the archons true or real? It's about whether or not they're useful as a system to engage with. And if you personify, John, I, maybe you can remember who said this, but there was somebody who's like, time isn't the archon that's limiting you. What's limiting you is the fact that you have to get to your job on time. Do you know what I, I mean? Like, said that, but let's yeah. say me. Yeah, good quote. So I'll take it. Yeah, <laughs> the the. The and again going back to the not or to the stoicism thing is that like why are you stressed about getting to your work on time? It's because you're making a judgment about that. Your boss is making a judgment about that. Yeah. Like all these judgments are happening all around us all the time, stressing each other out. And so then if you start to maybe if you do a ritual to prevent you being from being limited by the archon of time, maybe you also end up getting getting up earlier. Do you know what I mean? And you didn't think about that when you started doing the ritual, but it's actually the result. Yeah. I really, I haven't, believe it or not, guys, I haven't figured this all out. And I think <laughs> that there, I, I think the Gnostic myths are intentionally confusing and complex so that you will chew on them, right? So that you will get your own conclusions. I honestly believe that. I think that the 2,000 years ago, that's what people were doing when they wrote the secret book of John. Like a Zen poem. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um so I always want to stay away from this idea, especially if you are going to have a personal god or a anthropomorphized god, that this is all a test, that this is all good for us, because I think Gnosticism takes takes suffering seriously. But at the same time, in the secret book of John, that there's a very interesting part of the myth where Sophia, after the Demiurge is created, he steals from her what's usually translated as dynamis. And that dynamis becomes us. But it's usually translated as power. But really what it means is something more like potential. Mm -hmm. So th there's definitely a teaching there that is talking about Somehow all of this is necessary and this friction is necessary for this potential to become something more. We talk a lot about the sacred flame on the show, as in that everybody has a spark of the divine. But really the, the Gnostics' favorite metaphor is a seed. We have a seed of the divine in us. There, there's a potential that is there that can grow. It, it's, it's exactly what you said, Oliver, that uh, sometimes the, I know you're quoting, but some acorns become trees, some do not. Yeah. To engage with, but even push back on that a little, like rather than thinking that it's necessary, that there's a, that there's a, the, like to narrativize it, if that makes sense, to, to create a sense of true, not true, wrong in there, maybe. Rather than saying that it's necessary, maybe it's more, maybe another way to say it is more that it's likely like that by, by, by putting potential into the, if you're following this myth, like by Sophia, putting potential into creation that we are living, that we're engaging with, that potential is, is going to, is going to have a tension with the world around it as it develops the same way that like a tree is going to have to push earth out of the way to grow up. It's not rejecting the earth. It's not saying the earth is keeping it down, if that makes sense. It's just 
happen, or, or if it's necessary the same way a tree grows, not necessary in the sense that the tree is like embodying its like authority as a tree to grow. It's just growing. It's, it's a thing that trees do. Does that make sense as a distinction? Yes. Yeah. It does to me. I, so there's a couple things about that. I, I think he nailed it actually. There's a biological animal and plant kingdom biological. It's, I'm not a, I'm not a biologist, but I think it's either <laughs> hormesis or hornesis. I think it's hormesis, but this is a way in which usually toxic things create a stronger organism, right? So there's mm -hmm. ways where life will put something towards an organism that could be toxic or deleterious, for lack of a better word. Can't believe I pulled that word out. But we have something similar in the Gurdjieff work. So it's called the work. So you'll see a lot of healing traditions lately use the work. Like, are you doing the work, inner work? And I'm not mad at that at all. Like, I think that's fantastic because I think that will have the quality that's right. But it, it, I do think it came from the Gurdjieff work that I think one of the things that is really important to, to see is that we there's a payment for everything. There's coming back to my playing jazz piano. There might be lactic acid growing in your fingers if you're really new and you're getting really frustrated. That's part of the, it's called the denying force. Right, that's the denying force that we work against. Especially if you're going to try to run a 5K. Good lord, why would you do that? But yes, <laughs> it would be incredible lactic acid. You would have to understand that this would be a long. This would, this training might take longer than you think it would. Right, that's the denying force. I mean, for some people, it could be an intellectual denying force. You know, reading Ulysses, emotional denying force. Confessing your feelings to someone is a denying force. And then if they, you know, they don't feel the same, realizing that you would rather have them as a friend in your life, that's a bit of a denying force. There's a great strength that comes out of this. So we know that this resistance going to the gym is a denying force. So I think that this is the feature and not the bug. I think it's evolutionary, for lack of a better word. I'm I'm not it's there's some sort of thing that's life needs to see this proof it's not that fortuna is sitting there going yep oh good work or you didn't or yep sorry you guys are screwed there's there is just a pushing against that is needed and we know this we know this in our life in very physical very concrete things but for some reason the realm of psyche consciousness etc mindfulness it's not as concrete. So we think that it's a little bit more capricious when really it is showing up. It's doing the work. It's pushing a little bit more, not too much. Like we need to be, there needs to be a lot of self kindness at the same time as a little bit of that denying force. That's the yin and the yang of it. Excuse me. So you got to show up with discipline and you'll see those muscles grow. And no one doubts going to the gym is going to grow your muscles. We see that as given. We get that. We see it. It's physical. The thing that I want to help with and help explain that's in my experience, the stuff in the psyche and consciousness is the same. If you show up, you show discipline and you show self-kindness to your progress, those muscles grow just the same. Absolutely. That it, and the, the results will be noticeable. But it's not as concrete, so we think it's just up to some sort of capricious gods when really it's really just up to us. I wonder if like I, I before we started the show, we, we noted this a bit and I made a joke about Plato, but I wonder actually thinking of it in a little further, I wonder if the reason that we, we assume that the spiritual progress should be instantaneous is maybe because we're operating from this perception that we're connecting to something that is so eternal and transcendent that it's like, it should just always be there, if that makes sense. And we should just, it's like touching it versus lifting it, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And like you're saying it's a muscle. Or like maybe if you think about just to use a really like physical metaphor of like your eye literally is a muscle that is contracting and opening based on how much light you're trying to let into it. And that is that's the that's the work is just the muscle of your inner sight that you're trying to open and close but not it's not like that you just 
look at it and you're done. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, exactly. I think that kind of comes back to that dynamic potential where we're the universe trying to know itself. And sometimes maybe the universe doesn't have all the answers. It's figuring out the answers. There is this deeper undercurrent of joy, of connection that is our heritage. But maybe everything isn't completely figured out. So maybe Plato isn't exactly 100% right. Before we're talking about the, in the show, the, the Gnostics take quite a, a lot from Plato, but they also satirize him a little bit and maybe quite a bit. I'd say a lot. And, and I think looking towards what they disagreed with Plato about is, is very important. Ollie, uh, coming back to uh, your channel now, the, you gave us a little tantalizing hint, uh, a little piece of cheese. Uh, you said that you're considering starting an online course on meditation and mindfulness. And I, I'm wondering, two, the, the two-part question, what unique perspective or approach do you hope to bring to your teaching? And what have you learned about yourself and your practice from the teaching of the past? Because you are a teacher, you have done some teaching. Uh, I'm wondering if, if it's uh, helped your own practice, if it's uncovered things about yourself, yada, yada, yada. I really appreciate that. That's one of the things that I'm really trying to think about right now. So I'm trying to get it out by probably the end of this year. This is 2024. We're in September. Um, but what I do want to do is sprinkle. It's I'm going to use the word agnostic, agnostic <laughs> mindfulness that is informed by my experience in Zen Buddhism, Gurdjieff work, just being a human being in this weird, wonderful kind of situation, but also being in, I think we almost, we touched on it, being in a rapidly advancing technological world that does not always help us. It's very sexy and very fun, but how do we deal with that? How do we deal with these screens and how do we deal with embodiment when we're constantly being faced with screens, which to be honest, doesn't always promote embodiment. And I'm just just talking from my experience. So my aim with this is to give people a bit of a temporary visa into this because I can't do the work for anyone. I can't give anyone enlightenment because I'm not enlightened. I have great moments. I have a lot of thoughts about that, but I want to give people the tools that they can use to move forward in their life and use their life as a laboratory to take it off the cushion. Like that's what it's about. The cushion's great. And it's very important to be on the cushion in the morning because you're super creative, but what happens when you're at, say, you know, the drugstore and the cashier's in training and you're, you know, you need to catch the bus. So how do we take this into life as a laboratory? And thankfully I've fallen backwards in a way into this kind of training. A lot of Zen is about that. A lot of the Gurdjieff work, there's a lot of other trainings that I might not be familiar with, but how do we do this? And how do we do this in a world where the pressure is, the vice is just tightening on us right now, whether it be socially, whether it be technologically, whether it be geopolitically, especially save the best for last. It just, that's one of those things where if you're not, you're, if you're not mad, you're not paying attention. This world is, we are in a very strange projection of some type of weird demiurge of some sort as a model. So what's going on when we've got all these fractured mirror pieces showing us this weird shattered reflection how do we remember which is the entomology of that word is to bring the pieces back in mm -hmm. my and it's self-remembering how do we bring back pieces of ourselves because we are a multiplicity i've experienced this for myself i'm just going to suggest that to other people i'm not one static monolithic olive oil i wish i was i do think that's possibly possible that might be a type of enlightenment, but I'm a bunch of different Olivers and I have been today. So how do I slowly, how do I at least observe that? This is not to say that's evil. It's a way that we deal and do work in the world. And I'm not trying to demonize that. So how do we observe that? And how do we work with that? And how do we lose less energy from observing that and from working with that and take it off the cushion and use the tension in our life is that's the weight that we work with to build our muscles. The, the, those are the alarm bells that we need to work. So I went a little long in that one, but yes, how to teach, what is teaching going to give me? The teacher learns twice. I'm teaching what I have to learn. And I've got to a point after about 20 years of mindfulness practice and 15 years in the work, I you know, purely from a selfish point, I need to put, I need to level up. I need that next level of resistance, but I also have to bring it forward, which 
which is why it's so extremely edifying and empowering and uh, positive to talk to fellows all along this road, such as you two. So yeah, very thankful for that. So that's where I'm at. And it's, I've denied it for a while. I'm not going to say that I, I jumped at the chance the first moment I saw a glimmer, but, but yeah, I've got a hard enough head, but it got through. Unfortunately, we do have to start getting to the wrap up, but before I ask uh, my final question on this, Jason, have you got anything else lingering? Any more questions? Any thoughts? Any more? There's so many, so many that are popping up for me, but actually I was just looking over my notes here. One of the things that I noticed is one thing that came up occasionally came up at the top and it came up a little bit along, along the way of enjoying stories, like enjoying movies, comics, games, that kind of thing. Like I, I, I joke actually that my intro to Gnosticism was playing D and D with a DM who used the Nog comedy as a source text. He's an atheist. Like he didn't do it as any part of introducing me to anything. He was just like, this is cool. Yeah. Like, I guess where I'm getting, where my question would go here is, is there, was there something specific about the stories? Was there something about that process of getting lost in a plane of ideas that allowed you to also have them? go wait a second where what's happening to my body when i'm going over here kind of thing and maybe a bit of both i suspect and it's it's so unquestioned when you're a kid and you're going through it because you're just enraptured by stuff and archetypal i'm not i'm fascinated by young but i'm not any young yet expert but the archetypal is very real the platonic forms that we're to the ideal forms that we're talking about like that's a realm man that's a imagination is a realm J.R.R. Tolkien talked about it. Apparently he was, I was researching this a little earlier. He's, the elves were originally just going to be fairy, the realm of fairy. Mm. And it elves because it was a little more active and it had a little more power to it, I think. So we, there's a part of us that's always in that realm. That's always, it's, it's almost like amniotic in a weird way. There's some womb to there. And I also think that I got something from the very clear right and wrong from King Arthur. It was right to kill this dragon, or I can't tell you how many times I've seen Empire Strikes Back. I do think it's one of the greatest texts I've ever had. But when you got Luke Skywalker with his lightsaber and against who he doesn't know his father at the time, that's good versus evil. That's very clear. And especially when you're really young and impressionable, your parents are good, but they're doing evil to you by telling you you can't have a cookie before dinner like this there's just this oh but i'm sure i really want this there's the outside world and the inside world and that kind of thing that really stories help us arrange those they help us arrange our who we really want to be but also okay i need to suppress a little bit now to move in this world is this role of a dude who has to show up to the bus and show up to a, a job on time so it teaches us both at the same time i think it teaches us to live with some of those archetypes, but sometimes just to use the action figure, as Paul Hederman says, he also says that the non-duality teacher I talked about earlier, sometimes you need to switch in the action. You, sometimes you're just conscious. You are always consciousness, but sometimes you've got to limit the superposition down into the action figure, right? Mm -hmm. And stories really teach us that because sometimes our authority figures, our parents, our teachers and all that, are they're imperfect. They don't, they don't always practice what they preach. That fantastic quote by Joseph Campbell, the difference between history and myths is myths are always true. That's great. That dovetails quite well into my final question, which is, Oliver, you're a writer, you're a musician. Has your practice influenced your creative endeavors? Thanks, John. I'm not sure. It, it has, but I'm not sure in what way. I mean, it's... It really is a chicken or the egg thing. I don't know if being a creative kid made me more conducive to meditating or finding some sort of little meditation thing that I didn't have a word for. It made me more conducive to creativity. And I think it's both at the same time. I think it's, I, I do think, put that unsatisfying answer behind me. Is a need to give back? And to express back to this strange, weird, wonderful world that we see it. We are the nerve endings of consciousness. I obviously said that a little bit earlier. I might have not said it the right way, but I totally understand that. And so we need to give, I suspect, 
it's an extremely rewarding thing as these little nerve fingers of consciousness to give back to consciousness to go, yeah, I get it. It's, it is beautiful. It sucks sometimes. It is beautiful. And that also gives an energetic permission to the other nerve fingers that were around to do that, to do the same. It's always been a kind of calling that I n didn't always really have words for. It didn't always make sense. It also seemed like more work than it was worth. But thankfully at the ripe old age of 44, I've slowly realized like it's the only game in town, man. Yeah. There's a, like, I, I think we continually ignore the, the, like, everyday miracle of the fact that we can be moved by things that don't exist. Absolutely. What's happening there? That makes it exist. That, that, and, that makes it exist. That, exactly. Oh, yeah. 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 Really quick story, but I just, it, it seems like it's germane, is that I remember seeing a guy who is an uh, evangelical atheist write two blog posts. And I'm sure I've said this before, so some listeners will, will know where I'm going here. But he said his first blog post was, here's an article I read about why there is no physical proof that the flood ever happened. Therefore, Noah's Ark is a lie. Ha ha, I got you, you religious people. His very next post was being really upset that Disney made all of the extended universe Star Wars content legendary. <laughs> it is no less fictional than it ever was before. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's the world making that we are always, we always have like at our fingertips. Yeah. And he was really upset by it. Yeah. And you're upset that somebody took away your holy text and said it wasn't real. It, yeah. But you knew it wasn't real. Like yeah. you knew Luke Skywalker never existed. Oh, God. Oh. So, uh, yeah, that's absolutely it. It's really fascinating where our attention is the world making power. Mm -hmm. that's, that's it. The the other thing to to touch on here, and maybe this is a way to John can help bring it all together to a close, is that I often look at art and religion and esotericism, all of these things, as different levers on the same machine because we're trying to we're trying to experience something that is without words, and so we're using words which are insufficient, but they're only if we only look at them as a scaffold and not the thing itself, then they're useful. Okay, I, I think we did it. I think we figured out the universe. Nailed it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so, for a wrap up, first, Oliver, for people who are watching at home, they will see going across the bottom of the screen, youtube.com slash inward. It will also be in the show notes, so go there, listen and watch everything that Ollie is doing. If you want to help us keep the show going, help we always want to get more professional we always want to introduce more shows we always want to professionalize the show so i can remember to do things like introduce my co-op you can go to patreon.com slash gnostic and for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month you can help us keep the show going you can help us improve the show you can we always want to introduce more programming we've been talking about this for years if fans out there are tired of hearing about this but but it's what we want to do but we always need help doing it so what do you get by giving us money? If you go to the Patreon, you will actually see a whole bunch of things that we give in return. I need to delete those because we give you nothing in return. We're not one of those fancy podcasts that gives you more content. John, I'll push back on that. We give you this show. We do the show. Yes. That, that is right. a thing exactly. we do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's true. We don't give extra episodes. We don't put stuff behind the paywall because we don't want it behind a paywall. We want it out there for everybody. So by gifting us a little bit of money, if you have it, you allow us to keep doing the show. You can also do paypal.me slash Gnostic. That's great. Jason is jasonmml.com. Go there. And you can also help the show if you don't have any money, like me. And what you can do is tell people about the show. You can like and subscribe. Unfortunately, giving us a rating on the five-star rating or whatever the highest rating is on the podcatcher of your choice does help us get discovered by more people. Ear to ear, person to person, that's still very effective. Take your favorite episode, which will be this one, and send it to a pal. So thanks so much for helping. Ollie, I think we definitely have to have you back sometime. Oh, yeah, for sure. It'd be an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. I, I loved it. Yeah, it, it, it was a lot of fun, and I'm really glad that we figured out life, the universe, and everything. Everybody, thanks so much for joining us. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.